Yep, uh, I think it's um, worth noting when you said that there were too many martyrs. We have too many martyrs, right? I guess it's easy to, to die than to live, right? So it's, it's very important because I guess the most important thing is that because the root of everything comes back to one specific doctrine, I believe, that is returning to the back to uh, the time of Asara Fasole, right? And what you mentioned was goodness is not packaged in 7th century. So I guess that's, that's correct. Because nowadays it seems that what is important for Muslims is that to go back, to return back to the past, to the, to the glory of the generation of the Prophet and his companions, without looking into specifics of that we are basically living in the 21st century, time has changed and civilization has changed and our understanding of many things have changed as well. Right, and um, I think that that is a very uh, important thing that we have to look into. And uh, more importantly is that, that when you say that Sharia is not a set of rules, not only a set of rules, but uh, I think that we have to understand that uh, we have to look at the essence of, of Sharia itself, right? Like what you said uh, when you quoted Ibn Qayyim as saying that, you know, the principles of justice and equality I mean, these are some of the important ingredients that we have to understand and we have to try and embrace it, right? The problem now what we're facing in this modern century is that when we talk about the higher intentions of Sharia, there is justice, equality um, and other aspects of these higher intentions, we were being labelled as liberals, as neo Muqtazila, and a few other uh, derogatory terminologies. So I guess that it's very important for us to look into it again and to discuss and debate on this particular important issue. Uh, with that, uh, I think I would like to invite uh, our second panelist, a distinguished speaker from uh, National University of Singapore, uh, who, is, uh, who has been with us for, on many occasions, Prof. Saifar al -Atas. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, the Alhamdulillah, the Dikrihi, the Kulub, the Salat, the Salam, the Allah Sayyidina, the Habibina, the Muhammadin, the Nabi, the Mahbub, the Allah Alihi, the Man, the Ilahi, the Mansub. Um, first of all, thank you to um, the Penang Institute and Islamic Renaissance Front for the invitation. I'm always happy to, to speak here. Um, I'm also happy to meet for the first time uh, Professor Ibrahim Musa. We had been in touch by email um, for some years. Um, and um, he was just telling me that he had met um, my parents many years ago. Um, so I'm very happy to, to see him in person this time. Um, let, me, let me begin with the problem. Malaysians, I think, are perplexed and confused for many reasons, but uh, um, one reason is because we are said to be a moderate society. Uh, the Prime Minister has um, uh, said that we follow a moderate understanding of Islam. The Prime Minister supports moderation. For example, you have the global movement of Moderates Foundation. <clears throat> but at the same time, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the Prime Minister and others in the leadership have said that Islam is against pluralism. Um, Christians are forbidden to use the, the, the term, the word Allah. <clears throat> the state of Qadah recently issued a list of several words that non-Muslims cannot use including uh, Salaamu Alaikum. So I should therefore, you know, I'm not sure if there are any non-Muslims in the audience. I did say Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, for those of you who are non-Muslim, please don't respond with Alaikum Salaam. Um, Muslims who touch dogs, <coughs> Muslims who touch dogs are criticized for being westernized or liberal. Shiites have been persecuted. 
Uh, there are now discussions about how to amputate. Um, the most latest uh, creative uh, um, proposal was that we use the guillotine, you know, in Kelantan that have been discussed. Yeah, because you see, it's difficult to get doctors to, to, do, to do the amputation because it's against their ethics. ethics, right? So they thought maybe the guillotine would be the... <laughs> it's been discussed. Um, so the question really is, what do we mean by moderation? And what do we mean by, <clears throat> by extremism? What, what I really want to talk about is, um, is this. Now, um, in order to define extremism, it's useful to, or maybe necessary to define or to understand what we mean by, by moderation. Now, of course, you know, the well-known um, uh, term in the Quran uh, that the Muslims are an ummatan wasatan, the people of or the community of the middle way. Now, what does that mean? Now, it seems to me that, that if we connect this with, uh, with the idea of justice in Islam, that the Quran says that we shall set up balances, al-muazin, we shall set up balances of justice for the day of resurrection and then none will be dealt with unjustly in, um, in anything. And now this is, a uh, this is a verse in the Quran. Yeah? Um, we'll set up balances. Now what this implies is that the balance, the balance is moderation. And what it then therefore implies is that extremism is the failure to establish the, the balance. This is how I think we can define extremism. Now for me what is important is not just to define extremism in terms of uh, abstractions, but to look at concrete reality to look at the different ways in which extremism is manifested. Um, so I'd like to give some examples of that. Now let me begin uh, perhaps with uh, something that was uh, noted um, by Professor Ibrahim Musa just now. He mentioned this term, makarim al-akhlaq. Right? There's a famous hadith of the Prophet that has been mentioned throughout history by, uh, by Muslims. Um, and in fact, I think I can, I remember um, um, one of the more recent uh, mujaddid or renewers of um, the modern world, Badiou Zaman Said Nursi, in a very famous um, khutbah that he gave in the Umayyad Mosque in 1911, uh, known as the Khutbah Shamia, the Damascus Sermon. Uh, he also um, begins with this uh, uh, hadith, you know, Inna Allahi bu'uthni li utammima makarim al-akhlaq. Then it continues to say, wa li mahasin al-af'al. So makarim al-akhlaq, the, the, um, uh, the, the nobility of uh, ethics, and mahasin al-af'al, the beauty of action, right? So you have you have the the um, the spiritual, psychological dimension, ethics and morality, and then you have the action. Now here you have two two poles on a continuum: belief on the one hand, and action on the other. Now this is an illustration of what I mean by moderation. The, tr the idea to be a good Muslim and to be a good human being in general is to strike a balance between action and thought. When I say balance, you cannot be all action and no thought, neither can you be all thought and no action. The idea is to put your thought into action. Right? So this is what I mean by you know, the defining extremism in terms of the failure to establish the, the balance. Now, let me give you some examples. The failure to establish the balance has to do with 
balance between principles. There is always an opposition, a tension, when it comes to our belief and action according to certain principles. Now, there are a few principles in Islam, and I believe these are universal principles, that are necessary for us to live by, but they can only be lived by if we establish the balance. Now, I want to give some examples of this, of these principles, about six or seven examples. Now, the first um, example, the principle of inclusivism versus exclusivism, right? Now, moderation requires diversity. We need to live with others. As Muslims, we need to live with others who are non-Muslims. Uh, we also need to live with other Muslims of a different, uh, you know, madhab or aqidah from us, different sect from us. Um, so we need to we need to be inclusive. At the same time, we cannot be so inclusive as to include any and every one in our community. For example, if people says, you know, we believe in the worship of uh, of Satan and we have the right to worship Satan and we want to have our, uh, you know, our place of worship, we want to have fund fund funding from the government, we want to have freedom of expression. Uh, if the Nazis you know, say the same thing, we cannot say, well, in the name of inclusivity, we, can, we welcome you, uh, you know, into our community and we give you the same rights as everybody else. So there's a limit to being inclusive, but there's also a limit to being exclusive. We cannot say, well, we are Shafi'i, we don't accept any other way of uh, thinking and any, any other way of uh, practice. So you have no right to be Muslims in this uh, country if you do not conform to this understanding of Islam. So uh, therefore, clearly, we can, you can see here that moderation means striking the balance between inclusive, inclusiviz, inclusivism and exclusivism. Now another example, another uh, principle, um, the, um, this has to do with tradition versus modernity. Um, we cannot preserve tradition to the extent where there's no change. There's no recognition of the need to change. On the other hand, we cannot um, embark on a process of change that destroys tradition. So again, here, there is the need to, uh, to strike the balance between the desire to preserve tradition on the one hand and the desire to bring about change on the other hand. Right? Um, now, we can find many examples of uh, extremism uh, where there is the failure to establish this balance. Example, my favorite example is, is Saudi Arabia, where there is in Makkah there is the destruction of, uh, of heritage, there is the destruction of tradition, there is the destruction of, you know, of old buildings, of uh, tombs, you know, of graves, of um, uh, homes uh, and buildings associated with, uh, with the Ahlul Bayt, with, uh, uh, with the Sahaba. Um, so you have here tradition being destroyed and making way for the modern, in terms of skyscrapers, buildings, clock towers, um, hotels, and um, so on and so forth. Um, third example, uh, the, and this is somewhat related to the first, uh, the, 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 the need to, um, to, to have an, an, some kind of permanence, because we are secure with the permanent, um, on the one hand, uh, and the need to innovate to deal with uh, changing circumstances, changing historical, sociological, and cultural circumstances. So we are against uh, um, um, too much of change. Um, on, on the other hand, we do not want to be, you know, to be fixate, to be fixated with, uh, with the past to the extent where there is no change. Um, and here, you have uh, the extremist who would say that well, any kind of change is a wrongful innovation, bid'ah. Um, now clearly we cannot accept that. On the other hand, we don't want to change any and everything in our religious beliefs and practices and rituals. So you, there is this uh, uh, need to strike the balance. Um, now, the third, which I think is related to the phrase makarim al akhlaq uh, the, the, the issue of law and spirituality. Clearly you need both in Islam, law and spirituality. The Sharia, the rules and regulations by which we live, 
um, must be adhered to. But an extremist would practice Islam. The, the experience of, a, of an extremist practicing Islam is, is, uh, uh, is a practice solely according to laws and rules, without the spiritual experience, without the religious experience, you know, without um, uh, the, um, uh, the inner meaning of the, uh, of, uh, that lie behind the rituals. Um, on the other extreme, you have people who say, well, you know, uh, what is important is the ni'a, is the, the, the spiritual predisposition, um, and therefore the rituals aren't important. You, one can dispense with the rituals, one can dispense with the salat, for example. Uh, this is another extreme. So clearly here you have an, uh, an understanding of moderation as striking the balance between the need to follow rules and regulations on the one hand, and the need to have a spiritual experience on the other hand. Um, now, another principle has to do with the regulation of life. And here you have the, t the tension between the need, the need to regulate our lives, especially our social lives, on the one hand, and the need for personal freedom, on the other hand. Right? There are these tensions. Um, we want to regulate because it is necessary to regulate in order to protect the freedom of uh, individuals. But we do not want to regulate to the extent where we are infringing upon people's uh, privacies. Now, I think in Malaysia, we do have examples of the failure to strike this balance. For example, the Khalwat laws, um, where people's personal spaces can be, uh, can be violated. Um, clearly, in Islam, there are injunctions against um, Khalwat, there are injunctions against um, adultery, for example, but what is uh, up for discussion and what is questionable is whether um, Islam permits religious police to raid hotel to raid hotel rooms or to raid uh, you know people's uh, homes to look for people um, in the act of violation. So here you have again an example of the failure to establish the balance between the need for regulation in society and the need to preserve people's uh, personal um, space or uh, privacy. Um, and that is also related to another uh, uh, principle and that has to do with coercion and freedom, this dichotomy between coercion and freedom. We want to be free, but giving people too much freedom means that they may infringe upon the personal freedoms of others. Um, so there has to be also coercion to coerce people into respecting uh, certain rules and regulations and rights so that everyone can be, can be free. Um, so a government, any government, needs to uh, strike that balance between their use of coercive powers on the one hand and the preservation of the, of the freedoms of people on the other hand. And I think what has been happening in, in Malaysia is that this striking of the balance as far as coercion and freedom are concerned, is slowly um, being um, lost. We are, uh, we are losing that ability to strike that, uh, that balance. Um, so these are just some examples of, uh, of um, areas in our lives where there's been a failure to strike the balance between two extremes. And when you are not able to strike the balance between two extremes, that is when you get uh, extremism. Um, I was just uh, recently um, reading uh, an article uh, by, by Dr. Addis, who is here with us, um, on, um, I think you call it neo-traditional Salafism, um, in which he was describing uh, neo-traditional Salafism um, as being based on a literal rather than a figurative interpretation of, uh, of the Quran. So for example, and I've also talked about this myself, um, in, um, particularly in the context of inter-religious dialogue, you have um, um, verses in the Quran uh, which, um, if you take them out of context, it, they would require us to be uh, at best indifferent but at worst hostile towards Jews and, and Christians. Um, 
And uh, you do have Muslims who interpret these verses out of their historical context and therefore who enjoy and join violence uh, um, against um, non-Muslims. Um, now, obviously, we need to, again here to strike the balance between the requirement of metaphorical, figurative interpretations of uh, the, the Quran uh, and literal interpretations. Now, we cannot say that every verse has to be interpreted in a figurative manner. Right? When, when the Quran says to, to, to do salat, to do prayer, that cannot be interpreted in a figurative, you know, metaphorical manner. It is to be inter interpreted literally. We are supposed to pray in a certain way, with certain physical actions and so on and so forth. But clearly there are many other... Uh, and, and also the verse about uh, you know, prayer is not contextual. It's non-contextual. Right? Uh, in other words, the prayer is not meant for certain historical periods in certain geographical locations or certain uh, social situations. Um, but then there are other verses which need to be interpreted in a contextual manner. Um, and again, here you have the need to strike that balance. W to what extent and where are verses to be interpreted literally and, and, uh, and, and where not to be interpreted literally. So these are just some examples. And I think there are many other examples uh, we can think of various principles. I mentioned the principle of in inclusivism versus exclusivism, tradition versus modernity, permanence versus innovation, and so on and so forth. I think there are various principles that we can uh, um, uh, identify um, in order to understand how we are becoming um, extremists. So this is really, I think, uh, where we need to, what we need to move to towards um, in um, our discussion in, in Malaysia today. See, because, you know, we talk about extremism, and many of us have an idea of what it is. We sort of recognize it when it takes place. But we're not able to put our finger on it. We're not able to, identif to, 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 um, to define it. For example, many, many people, um, when this I want to touch a dog incident happened, there are many Muslims who reacted, you know, by saying, uh, I mean, when the, when the religious authorities uh, reacted against that, many people said, well, that seems to be a bit extreme when they're saying that, you know, uh, you know it, is, it is haram to, to touch a dog and that was wrong action and so on and so forth. Many people thought that this is a bit extreme. But how do you define that as extremism? How can we objectively define it? How can we objectively define many things that are being said and that are happening around us as extremists, even though we feel it is extremist. Now, in the case of uh, I want to touch a dog, I think the, uh, how to define it, uh, the position against touching, touching dogs as extremists uh, has to do with the inclusivism, exclusivism uh, uh, principle. Um, if you are more inclusivistic, in other words, we say that it is permitted to taqlid, to follow another madhab, for example, the madhab maliki, if we are open, then we, are, we would say that um, according to this school of thought, it is permissible to keep dogs as pets, for example, and to touch dogs. Um, and so, so one may follow that, even though one is Shafi, but one may defer to uh, Maliki Madhab if, um, if one wishes to. Um, then we are being more inclusivist. But if we choose to be exclusivist and we say, no, in this country we only follow the Madhab Shafi and that is the only valid uh, school of thought, um, then I think we are being more exclusivist and by definition extremist. So for any particular event or issue uh, or idea, we have to establish what the principles involved are and then we may uh, think um, about what is extremist uh, and what is striking the balance as far as that particular thought, idea or event is, um, is concerned. Um, so I think what we need to do in this country is to have more um, serious discussions to educate ourselves and to, edu to, edu and to educate the, uh, the public about um, what extremism means. Now, when, when we are clear about what extremism means, we're in a p better position to understand what has been happening to Islam in Malaysia. Um, in terms of what we understand by moderate Islam, the ability to 
strike the balance between extremes, we will see that historically Islam has, it is true that Islam has been moderate in Malaysia. It is not true of Islam today in Malaysia. Malaysia is definitely heading in an extremist direction. Malaysia is no longer a model. In the 1980s, when I was a student in America, Malaysia was put up as a model by many Muslims. I met scholars, I met um, st fellow students who said that Malaysia is the way to go for Muslim countries. Even the Turks and the Iranians in the 1980s said, look at Malaysia, a modern, somewhat democratic country, um, but still holding on to tradition, still identifiably Islamic. M people, Muslims considering themselves as Muslims, following tradition, but embracing modernity in a particular way. That's no longer the case. Today, if you go to Turkey, <laughs> they will say, look at Malaysia, that's what we need to avoid. <laughs> right? And this is happening. Uh, and I find it very embarrassing when our, lead, our leaders say that Malaysia is a, is a model, you know, the, the world, the Muslim world looks up to us. It's very embarrassing, it's not true. And that advertisement, you know, Malaysia truly Asia, is also very embarrassing because it's not true. It's true of our people. The people are still like that. Thank God, so far, the majority of our people are not affected by the racism uh, and the religious uh, obscurantism. But the danger is that we will be if this continues. So, as I said, what we need to do is to define extremism, to understand it, to understand its various manifestations, and then to, re, to re, um, recover our lost traditions in Islam, the lost traditions of Islam in the Malay world. For example, it's going around now that Maulid is haram. Have you heard this? Are you familiar with this? I don't know how many of you have actually been enc encountered this, whether the Ustads are telling you, you know, that Maulid is haram, it's uh, bid'ah, it's uh, wrongful innovation, or celebrating the birth, birth of uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, but this has been going around in various mosques um, and various uh, you know, uh, re religious classes and so on. Uh, and a lot of uh, Muslims in this country don't realize that the Maulid is a, an institution that, that has been around for centuries and is part and parcel of the, of the tradition of Islam in this part of the world as well as other parts of the world. What happens is you have a Salafi preacher who comes to Malaysia you know, with all the right credentials uh, the, the thobe, the robes, the long beard, um, uh, the um, bad uh, uh, English, um, but you know, fluent Arabic. And then when he says Maulid is haram, the, the, the Muslims here said, well, I see, we didn't realize, so we have been doing things wrong all these years. Our Malay Ustads, you know, I, I guess they don't know as much as these Arabs. So this is what's going on and our traditions are being uh, eroded uh, gradually. So we need to understand what extremism is and what our tradition of Islam is in this part of the world to recover that, all right? Because our, the tradition of Islam in this part of the world had managed to strike the balance in all the ways that I've been talking about. It was, wasn't too inclusive to accept any and everything, but neither was it exclusivist to the extent that it would reject uh, others, it would reject other schools of thought within Islam, or it would reject uh, non-Muslims, good relations with, uh, with non-Muslims. Those of you who are much older than I am um, will remember a time in the 50s, 40s, 50s, and 60s where race relations were very good, and people were not, Muslims were not uh, less of Muslims in the 1950s and, and 60s. Um, so I believe this is one of our, our tasks. Now, having defined uh, extremism, I also want to say that when we try to understand cases or examples of extremism in this country, um, we can give many examples. Uh, the, uh, studying the fatwas uh, is, is very interesting. It's a lot of data, you know, and for anyone, I would you know, recommend people to, you know, to do masters and PhD degrees on 
uh, examining fatwas uh, that have been coming out of Malaysia because in the last few years, they're so, so interesting and there's a you know, wealth of, uh, of data. Um, it'll of course you know, be very embarrassing for us as a nation to reveal all these fatwas to the world, but uh, it's necessary. Um, Qadar came out with, uh, I, I don't know how recent it was, I saw the news recently and I think maybe other states have done the same thing. A list of words that Mus non-Muslims may not use. Assalamu alaikum, uh, alaikum salam, um, masha Allah, um, what else? Subhanallah, and, and many words cannot be used, right? So, uh, I mean, it seems so ridiculous to even take seriously, but because it comes from religious authorities, it has to be taken seriously. Um, and you know we we need to again go back to tradition to to show that you know these are not supported theologically, and also people don't realize you know in in the Arab world in uh, in, in the Middle East in Iran in Turkey, um, I, I think maybe the same in Bosnia, I'm not sure, uh, in Egypt, Jews and Christians habitually say these words, because these are part of the language. Turkish uh, Jews and Turkish uh, Christians, Iranian Jews, Iranian Christians, Coptic uh, Egyptians, say mashallah, say salamu alaikum, this is part of the language, right? And the ulama have not said in these countries uh, that these are not allowed for non-Muslims to, uh, to say. Now, uh, I just give this example of the fatwas to, sh to show you that you know, we have in Sunni Islam, I mean in the Sunni community, we have uh, developing extremism. But I also want to say that although you may find extremism among Sunnis, to me, the most important manifestation of extremism in Malaysia today, and indeed I think the Muslim world, is Salafism. It's the most important manifestation. There are, there, is, there, are, there are extremist Sunni scholars, extremist Sunni views, extremist Shiite scholars and extremist Shiite views. Um, you have a strong uh, you know, anti-Sunni trend um, in Iran, restricted to a particular Shiite group um, and discredited by the Iranian state, but you have anti-Sunnism among Shiites. Uh, and you certainly have, uh, you know, extremist Sunni ideas among Sunnis. But as far as a coherent global ideology is concerned, the one extremist, ideo extremist ideology among Muslims today is Salafism. Um, and uh, this, I think, is important to study. There is no serious debate in Malaysia about it. In fact, you know, uh, Ibrahim mentioned, you mentioned um, the need to think about what Islam is, right? The need to think about what Islam is. This is, of course, very true. The problem is we are being restricted more and more in our, th in our thoughts. Thinking is controlled. Ten years ago, the kinds of things that have been happening in Malaysia di didn't happen. The, th the kinds of things that are happening now. Being arrested for saying something. Um, or, you know, um, I mean, I remember in 2009, I gave a talk uh, at the IAIS on uh, Sayyidina Hussein on the occasion of Karbala. And I gave a talk in Malay, as a Sunni scholar, about Sayyidina Hussein. Today, it's impossible to do that. Just a few years later, it's impossible to give a talk, even in English, I believe, but especially in Malay, on Sayyidina Hussein, because that would be seen to be, you know, Barbao Shia, as the Malays say. And my talk, I got one full page coverage in Brita Haryan, again, Malay language newspaper. It would be impossible today. So, there is a restriction on our, th our thought. But nevertheless, you know, we, one has, still has to, people still have to go on. There needs to be more serious discussion about what Salafism is, to what extent Salafism is uh, being introduced to Malaysia, to what extent it is eroding our traditions. Now, I am not calling for the persecution of Salafis. I'm not calling for uh, Salafism to be banned. Uh, I know there are Salafis in Malaysia and, and even Sunnis among the religious authorities who are calling for 
liberalism to be banned, for pluralism to be banned, for feminism to be banned, and there's been a terrific uh, persecution of Shiites in, in Malaysia. Just recently, a few, I think a week ago, there was the arrest of some Shiites in Johor, in the state of Johor. Um, uh, now, I'm not calling for the same action to be taken against Salafism, but we must have uh, a national debate. Scholars um, and others and activists should, understand, should be made to understand what Salafism is, how it is eroding Malay Islamic uh, tradition, uh, what the views of Salafis are towards uh, Sunnis and towards Shiites and towards um, cultural practices of uh, Muslims and so on and so forth, so that people can be informed and hopefully people will exert pressure on uh, the authorities to uh, do the right thing in terms of recovering our, our tradition. That is why I bring up um, the issue of Salafism. But there's also a security matter, because there is the issue of the extent to which even peaceful Salafism prepares the ground for more violent, um, uh, for, uh, you know, for, for people to, to um, take on a more violent understanding of, uh, of Salafism. Um, because w one could argue that even the quietest, the so-called quietest Salafis, the Salafis who do not believe in violence, who are against violence, one could argue that even the quietest Salafism, in terms of its beliefs, is extremist. It's rejection of Islamic tradition. It's rejection of, uh, uh, you know, of contextual interpretation. It's rejection of um, you know, underlying, um, what do you call it, of the, uh, that in, uh, what do you call it, ta'wil, right? One could, one could make that argument, all right? Uh, I'm saying we need to discuss this. Um, and then the connection between quietist Salafism and uh, the more so-called you know, takfiri, jihadi um, Salafism. So th I think th these things need to be uh, discussed, not with a view of persecuting Salafis, not with a view of banning Salafism, but with a view of creating more understanding um, in Malaysia about these, um, these problems. Um, now, I, uh, I want to, how much time do I have, by the way? Okay. I want to, to um, spend the last few minutes talking about the function of um, extremism. Professor Musa talked a great deal about the context and the causes of extremism. Um, I've tried to talk more about the definition of extremism. Now I want to now say something about the function of extremism. See, for any phenomenon, for any, for any phenomenon, we can talk about what it is, its definition, we can talk about its causes or its origins, and we can talk about its function, the effects, the impact that it has. Um, so I'd like to just end by talking about now the, the function or the impact of extremism. Now, I'd like to highlight two or three uh, points. One is that um, when people are dominated by an extremist mentality, there is a deflection of attention and resources from the real problems of society. Um, for example, if you are obsessed with you know, discovering uh, people's um, illicit sexual acts, um, you know, you spend your resources, uh, you know, on uh, uh, kind of legal voyeuristic uh, activities um, rather than spending my, your time and resources looking for errant um, divorced men, you know, who are not paying their alimony, you know, their payments uh, to their divorced wives, um, or reducing uh, sexual abuse, um, dealing with the problem of incest, <coughs> which is seems to be you know, a serious problem in uh, our, our society. Um, educating the public about rape so that people um, don't blame uh, rape on the way women dress and that they understand that rape has to do with power and control and psychological problems among men and not with the way women dress. For example, whether women use hijab or not. It's really insulting actually, if you think about it, to women to say that she is raped a woman is raped because of the way she dressed or because she did not use hijab. That's, that is not only sociologically and psychologically untrue, 
uh, rape has not got to do with the way women dress. It's also very insulting to women. Um, so, uh, extremism, I think, does deflect attention from the real problems that we, that we have. Um, now, the other point is that extremism very often constitutes an ideological justification for exploitation. Um, in more general terms, it constitutes an ideological justification for the current economic order. I gave you the example of uh, Saudi Arabia, where you have a destru destruction of, uh, of heritage. Um, now, that destruction of heritage uh, is not simply an expression of um, uh, Salafi views about the place of tradition in Islam. Uh, for example, you know, Salafi views against uh, the institution of ziyara, of uh, visitation of, uh, of tombs. Um, so they are against that, and they may destroy a tomb um, uh, with the argument that these are not allowed in Islam. Uh, now, the destruction of tombs and other heritage sites is not simply an expression of that theological belief. It also functions to make way for capitalist development, the building of hotels, of shopping malls, and so on and so forth. Um, so here you have a very interesting affinity between uh, theological ideas and modern capitalism. So this is an example of how extremism justifies the current order, in this case the current um, economic um, order. And I'd advise you to you know, do some reading up on the destruction. It is really very, very sad. Already now, Makkah is not how it used to be. 20 years ago, 50 years ago, even 10 years ago. It is uh, a blatant destruction of heritage. To me, it is ultimately, it is a form of cultural kufur. Cultural kufur. Cultural apostasy. You know, a kafir is one who covers up the truth. Right? Kafara, to cover, right? To cover up. Now, I'm not accusing the Saudis of being kafir in the religious sense, right? But it is a kind of cultural kufr in the sense that they are erasing, covering up, erasing history, erasing heritage, erasing tradition. Uh, and it also shows that it is the worst kind of modernity, the worst expression of modernity, because Modernity, in, its, in terms of its extreme, uh, is an erasure of tradition. In Europe, um, European capitalism, Western capitalism, has gone beyond you know, the 18th century, 19th century capitalism in the sense that it has checked itself, it has controlled itself, it has exercised restraint. You have conservation laws, strong, strict conservation laws, which you do not seem to have in Saudi Arabia, and I'm, I'm sure that's the case in other Muslim countries, certainly is the case here. We do have our problems here as well, in Malaysia. So, um, you know, but you know, it's happening and there's no outcry, there doesn't seem to be any outcry from the Muslim world, the organization, the OIC, or Muslim governments don't seem to be exerting pressure on the Saudis to save our, our heritage. So, let me just conclude by, by, by this. What, what needs to be done? I think in the afternoon session we will talk more about what we need to do to stem the, tide of, stem the tide of extremism. But uh, briefly, let me say this. A few things I think we need to do as a society, uh, as scholars, as activists, as, NG as NGOs. First of all, to revive traditional Islam. In this part of the world, traditional Islam is largely the Sufi tradition. Um, in order to restore the balance in all these different ways that I mentioned. Um, it's a kind of Islam that is non-sectarian and a kind of Islam that preaches harmony with, uh, with other um, religions. Um, we need to have a better media because our media, especially the state-controlled media, is, has a low standard intellectually at best. At worst, extremely responsible for carrying stories that inflame Make that you know make the situation worse. Um, the uh, kinds of things that are reported on Shiism in the past, uh, the kinds of things that are reported on Christianity, um, uh, the, the, the media continues to report about ISIS as being Sunni militants, which is not true, right? G 
giving the impression that it's a Sunni Shiite war that is taking place in Iraq and, and Syria. So our media is ex really needs uh, you know serious uh, revamping. I'm saying this as a fact. I have no illusions you know as to whether this can actually take. I, I doubt it will be revamped, but this is a necessity. So you, we need the political will to make these changes, but I don't think currently we have in this country the political will to make such uh, changes. Um, now, this is something, uh, another thing that we need to do is to study other extremisms. There's too much, uh, uh, there is one-sided emphasis on Muslim extremism. Muslim extremism is a problem in this country as well as elsewhere. But in many uh, Muslim societies, and this is very, very true in Malaysia, we do not give any attention to other religious extremisms. For example, Christian evangelism is a form of Christian extremism. We don't study it. I'm not aware of uh, you know, uh, Christian scholars in this country who, uh, who are studying it. I'm, they must be, but I'm not aware of, uh, of these studies. And certainly among Muslims, there are no experts on Christianity. There are no experts on Judaism. We don't have experts on Zionism, on Jewish extremism. Now, in the, in the world today, the extremism of at least four religions are important to understand the context of Muslim extremism. Buddhist extremism in Myanmar, to some extent in Sri Lanka, Hindu extremism in, in India, to some extent in, in, uh, in Malaysia as well, and certainly Jewish extremism in the West, in America, in Israel itself, and Christian evangelism, especially Christian Zionism in America. And of course, evangelism in countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. Muslim extremists are responding to the extremisms of other religions. Not everything that happens in, in, among Muslims has to do with the response to uh, the, the extremism of, of other religions, but a great deal of it is. <coughs> Certainly, Christian Zionism has had a great impact on uh, the way Muslims think about the Middle East and about the Palestinian situation uh, and the way they think about Christianity. Uh, we went on a, ram on a rampage against Christianity here. I mean, there was that UITM, is it? I always forget, UTM or UITM, that conference on Christianity, UITM, in which, you know, Christian, Christianity was, was uh, more or less insulted. Now, if the conference had made it clear that they were talking about Christian extremists, about evangelism, and they define Christian evangelism. Again, you know, you can't, uh, uh, you, you can't um, uh, reduce Christian extremism to all of Christian evangelism, just like you can't uh, reduce, um, you know, um, violent extremism to all of uh, Salafism or all of Wahhabism. Um, you, so you need to define these things. What do you mean by Salafism? What do you mean by Christian evangelism? What are the different trends among Christian evangelists? Which are the ones that can we define as extremists? Um, and intolerant and exclusivist and pinpoint that as the problem then you will have no quarrel with the Christians and the Christians won't feel insulted we always demand that from the Christians and the non-Muslims when they talk about Islam but we don't exercise the same um, you know, restraints and the same uh, intellectual rigor when we deal with, uh, with them so I think we need to develop expertise on, on Christianity and other religions and other, the extremisms of other religions Finally, and this is what I want to talk about in some detail in the afternoon, we really need to work, to, we really need to work towards a multiculturalist, pluralist Malaysia. It is simply wrong to say that Islam is against pluralism. That is simply wrong. I think the people who are saying that haven't taken a basic course in sociology or anthropology or cultural studies to understand what pluralism is. This idea that pluralism means that all religions are the same theologically, that no religion has claim to the truth, is simply wrong. Pluralism does not state that, and it does not require that. Right? So we need to understand that. I'd like to discuss that in more, in more detail. But you know, Muslims really have to fight for the right to have a pluralistic, multiculturalist society. Not only because we respect the rights of other religions to exist in harmony in this country, but we also respect ourselves and our own intellectual integrity because we want to be pluralistic not only vis-a-vis -vis other religions but also vis-a-vis -vis ourselves. We want to have the freedom to be Muslims in the way that we each uh, see 
fit and w without being told by religious authorities that there's only one particular way to be, to be a Muslim. So I think this is something that we can take up in more detail uh, later on. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.